Um, and I'm here today to talk about privacy tax generally, um, but also focusing on Monero's strengths and weaknesses. So I don't want the takeaway from this presentation solely to be about Monero. I want a big portion of the presentation to be about why privacy is important and why privacy for all networks uh, needs to be taken really, really seriously. And some things to think about when you are evaluating the privacy implementations of whatever network you are interested in. So this is in general like a, this is what Monero is doing and why. Keep that in mind for however you wish to approach the cryptocurrency and blockchain ecosystem because this sort of thinking does not change no matter what cryptocurrency you're interested in. Um, very brief background, as Claudio mentioned, I'm the organizer of the Monero Community Workgroup. I'm also a compliance analyst at DB Chain, which is a cryptocurrency OTC desk. So if you have any questions about cryptocurrency compliance, I'm happy to answer those too. So privacy or compliance, sort of your guy there. All right, so table of contents, I'm gonna give an introduction to privacy and coin equality, uh, generally an introduction to Monero, talk about some basic tracing methods, and then conclude again on like uh, attacks and privacy to help wrap it all up again. So again, not just a talk about Monero, a talk about attacks on privacy generally also, and how Monero sort of tries to approach those. <laughs> so a lot of people think that privacy is sort of binary. They either think that you either have privacy or you don't. And to some extent that's true, right, where you have a certain threat model. This is the reason why you want privacy. And ideally, either you are able to defend yourself against that threat or you are not, right? Either the privacy is good enough or the privacy isn't. In most cryptocurrency implementations, there's a sort of privacy feature where it's either off and it's transparent like a Bitcoin or Ethereum type system, or it's on and they have some type of either mixing service or ZK snark or some additional implementation that provides additional privacy over the base level. It's a switch in terms of whether the privacy feature is on or off. However, in reality, privacy is really this really annoying spectrum where we can say that things are probably good in some cases and probably not good in other cases. And the list of nuances is 600,000 miles long. There are, like, it's hard to give a straight answer to be like, will I actually be safe in this situation? Will this privacy implementation protect in this way? Well, if you try to reduce it down to like a scientific experiment, you might say, oh, well, all else ignored, this should be fine. Or focusing on these very specific things, it should be appropriate. But real life is incredibly messy. And we might say that, oh, from a, a blockchain graph heuristic perspective, you're good, but what about timing? What about uh, you leaking your IP address? What about all the different associations with, you have with other users? Or what about the participants of the type of system? Suppose you had a system that was literally perfect on paper. There was not a single fault you could find with it, but you were the only one that was using this blockchain implementation. Is it really that private? Because if anyone tried to figure out who was using it, it's pretty obvious which single individual was trying to use this amazing system. So despite its otherwise amazing attributes, there still are significant real life shortcomings. So I want you to think of privacy instead of this like really messy web, which is unfortunate, but that's just a better, a better tie to reality because Users of these open permissionless networks are anybody, and they're going to do a wide variety of things. And if you are trying to design a protocol, you need to do your best to account for all the users' behavior on the network and make sure that they are adequately protected with whatever privacy feature you're trying to roll out. And it's therefore really messy. People do a lot of unpredictable things, and it's hard to answer for every single possible uh, use case that people have and, and threats, uh, you know, attackers are changing their tactics to be better and better over time. What someone did five years ago is not what people are doing today. People have gotten much better and I think over the next 10 years people will get much better than they currently are at uh, blockchain analysis. So like why does, uh, why does this matter at all for people I guess? Um, why do people care about privacy? Um, why don't 
why doesn't everyone want everything to be completely transparent? Well, I try to focus on the real practical reasons why you might want privacy on top of just the, I simply want privacy method. Some people want privacy for privacy sake, but for some people they need a little bit extra convincing. So let's say you wanna try and hide some of the sources of funds that are coming in. Well, if this is transparent, people will know who your employer is, people know who your family and friend connections are based off who pays you, uh, people know, if you're a business, who your upstream suppliers and connections are, so they're able to see where you're actually conducting a lot of your business with. And then also it impacts things like fungibility or coin equality, which I'll get to a lot uh, more detail later in this presentation, where the coins you receive might not be the same as other, as everyone else's coins. If there's a past history associated with them, you might be liable to some extent if you are receiving funds that are connected with some past history, um, just based off the blockchain connection. And um, most people aren't paying for blockchain analysis software, but most companies are. So people are at a substantial disadvantage when it comes to these levels of protections. Companies buy their way out of this problem. Individuals can't realistically spend thousands of dollars a month for these, this software to try and protect themselves. Um, related to their expenses, people might want to not let everyone know that they make political or religious uh, contributions and have those affiliations. Um, let's say you go to a specialist doctor and need to make them a payment, which is, of course, really common here in the United States. Um, you don't necessarily want to reveal to the entire world that you made a payment to a specialist doctor because now they know that you're going to a specialist. That leaks a lot of personal information. Um, if you're a business, at least all your customers and everyone else downstream from you, uh, it reveals your everyday purchasing habits. If you're a business, it also reveals who your employees are. So someone might try and just compile a list of who, who, who your employees are. And then also people know the amount in your account most of the time. So they know how much money you have. They know who to target with crime. Um, in the case of companies, we, we're already seeing that large companies are targeted um, for ransomware attacks increasingly. If we had a, a more transparent financial system, they would very clearly know exactly how much Bitcoin to ask for if they knew how much Bitcoin someone had. They'd be like, well, I know you can pay this because this is what you have. We already see in ransomware that they typically will try to obtain financial statements from companies before asking them for money because they want to have a better understanding of what they can ask for. Um, that is exacer exacerbated when you have a completely transparent system to begin with. Also, they can adjust, like adjust what the willingness to pay uh, suppliers are and how much you charge customers, willingness to pay employees for their your business. There's a ton of different implications on why transparency really, really gets messy. And I think that um, I'm going to talk more about the fungibility aspect because it's often misunderstood and I think it's a much bigger problem than most people think that fungibility is. Um, so how do we sort of address privacy. Um, so first, you can try to add tools to a transparent system, but it's really, really complicated to actually say whether they are effectiveness or not. So let's, um, let's say you have this big outer box. Um, those are all the transactions and just the, the orange one there um, that says Mixer, Tumblr, ZK Snark or ZK Stark or you know, whatever sort of privacy implementation you're trying to build. Let's assume that that's the, the optional privacy feature. So on the outside, let's say you have a transaction in uh, red there that goes between two transparent addresses. Well, obviously, it's a highly transparent transaction that conducts. Users who uh, conduct these transactions should not expect a high degree of privacy, and hopefully that's communicated to them and it's like understood by the users of the network. Um, but you know, ultimately, it's like a Bitcoin transaction. We know it's very, very public. Um, however, if you have a transaction that interfaces like one side in the transparent side, one side in the private side, no matter how good the privacy feature is, it's really hard to say whether or not something will be private enough or not. It, it highly depends on a user's use case. It highly depends on their threat model. Once you get into the, I reveal some information publicly, it's hard to give good descriptions about what level of privacy protections there are because users are revealing public information and it's, it's uncertain what an attacker can really do with that public information. Um, in some cases, it might be limited. In some cases, it might not matter. In other cases, it might be incredibly revealing. Um, so that's why I say, in this case, the effectiveness of 
a user who just tips their toe in this privacy feature will probably not have fantastic privacy. And across the ecosystem, most uh, researchers recommend that users do their very best to completely stay within the privacy system. Uh, now granted, you can have really poorly implemented privacy systems that don't really provide strong levels of privacy at all. Um, and users might still exclusively use those and therefore their protections might still not be great. Or you might have a really, really effective privacy solution. And if you know, it's possible for users to potentially use it very, uh, very appropriately and have high degrees of protections using those. So what I'm trying to get across at the slide is that it's, it's difficult to simply try and strap on a privacy feature as an afterthought to a network that is otherwise transparent because the actual implications of this for the vast majority of users are really, really complicated, where typically users are not getting anywhere close to the level of protection that you hope they are by using this system. In fact, they're usually getting uh, protections that are more similar to the transparent system than they are to the, the shielded system that you're trying to implement or the private feature you're trying to implement. So what did some initial privacy approaches look like? This is, you know, Bitcoin came out, people thought that it was reasonably private. Hey, it's not my identification number on the blockchain, it's just this random string. How transparent or revealing could that be, right? Well, um, after a short period of time, people realized, hey, my balances are public. Hey, uh, you're able to see that one address sent a transaction to another address and especially if you're participating in those transactions, you have a decent understanding of what's going on with the people you interact with, of course. So people thought of the idea of like centralized mixer, where you basically send your coins to a centralized source and they send a little bit back. You can think of these also as like coin join implementations. And, and now you have a bunch of similar sorts of things where instead of combining all your coins together and swap and you know, divvying a proportional amount, and now you'll swap coins and different things. They all really come from the same type of idea where you have a, a large number of participants, ideally, that come together. They send their coins either to a centralized service or they send them to a decentralized uh, protocol system that otherwise coordinates these. And it results in users getting either a fraction of coins or they swap out whose coins are whose. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, but coin join is the most popular way. Um, and this is one approach that people took in order to try and uh, get some higher degree of privacy in this type of system. But of course, there's many different disadvantages with this. So first of all, people who mix funds typically are starting with either illicit or likely suspicious funds to begin with. So if you have Coins that you just mined, let's say, as the previous speaker was talking about, you're probably not in incredibly incentivized to mix those because it would cost you an additional fee and you're likely just, you're, you're drawing suspicion onto yourself. Same being the case that if you had just bought the coins from an exchange. If I just bought coins from Coinbase and was not trying to do anything illicit with them and I mixed them, that's going to cause some suspicion on its own to everyone that I later communicate with. And it probably will give a warning to the exchange that I bought the coins from saying that, hey, this user withdrew funds from your account and then mixed them. That's relatively suspicious just because so few people are doing it. Um, so often using a mixer will increase your level of suspicion. Uh, furthermore, if you are using like a, a centralized mixing services, which, which are much less common nowadays, but they could be malicious. Maybe they would steal your funds. Maybe they would keep a log of what's going on. There's a ton of different ways for centralized services to screw you, your, you over and remove your privacy without you even knowing. Um, so it's important to be really careful about how uh, like these solutions typically are regarded in among privacy reachers as really, really primitive systems. And even if there's a, a really inter interesting, exciting one that comes out, there typically are severe limitations still to how it's implemented, just because it requires on the pool participants, it requires end users opting in to participate. Typically it's a, like a really slow, arduous process. And so it's, it's just pretty annoying in general. So yeah, often it takes time too. Like you, who 
wants to try and mix their funds like weeks in advance, um, just in anticipation of, of a future purchase. Like it, it, it's quite annoying. No one really wants to do that. So, um, however, this is really the best that we have for a lot of systems like Bitcoin, um, and, and increasingly is the case for a lot of other uh, other blockchain protocols, other cryptocurrencies that are adding privacy features on top of it. Um, on Bitcoin, the two leading approaches really are a Wasabi wallet and Samurai wallet. They definitely have like a feud between the two going on, uh, but these two have wallets that offer degrees of privacy protections that um, are better than what Bitcoin will offer. But I have to add the important caveat that even if uh, you do some research and figure out that they meet your uh, desired privacy requirements, you're still likely drawing suspicion on yourself for using these tools in the first place. And you're doing so on a transparent network where anybody can look up that you are using these wallets because since it's transparent, it's usually pretty easy to identify which transactions are related to mixing services, including decentralized mixing services. So, uh, you know, these, these systems are likely going to cause you some problem if you're trying to use them in, in reality. This is where, you know, on paper, we might say, okay, on, pro on a privacy level, maybe, maybe this is fine, but no one really wants to use it for all the other practical reasons that, that get into play here. Remember, we're, we're developing protocols, we're developing open permissionless cryptocurrencies, so people need to uh, use them in a, in a way where people actually get benefit from them. If they aren't, then we're, we're doing something wrong as, as protocol maintainers, right? I just want to give another note on the idea of zero knowledge because in the industry, people talk about things like zero knowledge proofs and they'll sort of paint them as something that they, they really aren't. So I want to give a quick uh, explanation about what zero knowledge proofs are in general and why uh, you, they might not mean what you think they mean. <laughs> so um, zero knowledge proofs address specific problems um, but they do so with like varying degrees of uh, of success and they do so with very different trade-offs so the idea of a zero knowledge proof is simply just that you can prove a statement without revealing like the conditions of the statement that make it true so you know they have a cave examples where you can go around and you can convince someone that you know that uh, a door to move around in the back of a cave or someone can't see you opening the, and closing the door um, without uh, actually seeing someone go in and out of the door if they have you repeat it multiple times. Um, however, zero knowledge proof doesn't actually speak to the privacy protections of a system. It just speaks to like a cryptography implementation. It's a cryptographic term. So we might say that uh, so, some protocol has implemented a zero knowledge X, Y, or Z, but ultimately, it doesn't mean that it actually protects a user against anything in particular. And furthermore, like even if it does imply protections over a like a certain thing, patching one hole, let's say, let's say uh, someone implemented a zero knowledge proof that hid the recipient really, really well. Fine, that's it's good, but it also doesn't hide the sender or the amount. Like there's a ton of other stuff to be worried about it, but. This protocol can go around advertising that they have a zero knowledge proof, even though it doesn't protect the vast majority of transaction information. Or a protocol could say it has a zero knowledge proof and not even provide any sort of reasonable protections at all for user privacy. So I just want to stress in a lot of my presentations that you'll hear the term zero knowledge proof occasionally. And it doesn't really mean anything, sadly. It you you need to focus on what actual user privacy protections are available. And this term does not describe any user privacy protections. It just describes a cryptography implementation, which may or may not have any sort of user privacy protections. So again, if it hides the recipient really well in this example, I mean, it doesn't hide any other information. And that's a really hard nuance to convey when it's just the marketing term, zero knowledge. Zero knowledge sounds like there is no knowledge of the transaction, but that could be not further from the truth in the vast majority of implementations. So just be really, really careful that uh, names can often be very, very misleading in, the play, in this place. So um, I talked about how with Bitcoin, people started adding uh, you know, privacy tools to it um, with, with opt-in features. 
And I think at this point, the vast majority of researchers will acknowledge that even though these efforts are useful to help protect users that do use Bitcoin, um, if they want some modicum of better privacy, they really are incredibly inadequate and they have a whole host of other significant downsides just because uh, the fungibility of the system, the coin equality of the system is se severely uh, impacted. Um, so what I'm gonna stress here is that really optional any privacy implementation, whether it's CoinJoin, ZK, Starnes, Atlantis, CoinSwap, Ring Signatures, or my you know, newly coined perfectly private system that I'm going to be launching in my next ICO. Um, they're, the, they're bad solutions for the wrong problem, right? We want to talk about user privacy and talk about ways to protect it, but ultimately if you have a, a rollout of a privacy tool that is not widely used, we are focusing on the wrong problem. We are not focusing on building protocols where users actually take advantage of the privacy, where users are protected against receiving tainted coins. Instead, we're too focused on a sort of hacker mindset where someone, like we're trying to help this one specific hacker who's trying to, you know, do this high profile case. I mean, that's just not the reality with users of privacy. The reality is people just don't want to reveal their entire transaction histories. They just want to be protected against mass surveillance. And if you have an optional privacy system, it does very little, if anything, to help protect mass surveillance of users. It only tries to protect users who are like involved in really high profile cases or are incredibly knowledgeable. These aren't privacy protections that are translatable to the vast majority of users. So it's, it's a bad solution because when you ever have this privacy, optional privacy, and in every single case we've seen, it's been very poorly adopted. Uh, you know, there are too many caveats to say, you know, there's a lot of concerns of how you interact with the transparent system. So it's a bad solution. And again, for the wrong problem, because it doesn't actually help prevent mass surveillance at all. <laughs> really, uh, you can't expect the vast majority of users to spend a lot of money to use CoinJoin and wait a long time and be willing to... Uh, you know, put up a fight with exchanges when they deposit funds there um, because they need to argue about why they should be using a, a privacy feature that everyone can see that they're using. It, it, it's really, really messy in reality. So um, this is what I want to get across with coin equality. When I was at a conference last year when people could still get together, I uh, had everyone in the room get a index card and I had people pass funds around. So I, I said, okay, write your name. So in my case, I'd write Justin. If I was giving money to, to Claudio, I would say Justin to Claudio and then give Claudio the card. And then Claudio would take his card. He would say Claudio to Alice and then give the card to Alice. And we repeated a few times, just everyone passing the cards around, um, pretending that the cards were sending outputs or, or transactions or however you want to simplify it down to. People are sending money back and forth on these cards. Well, um, after people had done that a few times, I stopped the, the group and said, hey, you know, Claudio, like, we're all fed up with him. No one wants to be in class anymore with this, this lovely professor anymore. So we're going to say, you know, we don't actually want to, uh, like, associate with Claudio anymore. Any card that says his name on it, we're going to put a little red stamp next to it to indicate it's sort of like a tainted set of funds. Okay, and now you get to go exchange your cards again. So people took their cards and I asked them, like, hey, if you have this red dot, good luck giving it to someone else, right? And in practice, even though this is not real money, right, these are just cards that were being passed along in the room, um, people avoided receiving the tainted cards. They did not want a card with a red dot on it, partially because they probably knew that they'd be called out in a later you know, group exercise to see why uh, you know, they have these tainted coins or tainted cards. Um, but in reality, that's what would happen. You would be called out by a service to say, why are you receiving funds that are associated with, with Claudio? Why are you interacting with Claudio, even if it happened many hops ago? Um, and then how do you think Claudio felt trying to get new cards from people? No one was willing to sell them cards or anything, right? Because they didn't want uh, their history to be associated uh, with this, this red dot. Um, interestingly, in, in, a, in a debrief um, after the presentation, some people raised their hands and saying they were willing to pay more for fresh cards. 
or we're willing to accept the tainted cards for some additional incentive on the side, whether it was like a, you know, an exchange of a business card or something at the, at the, at the uh, conference. Um, but like, you know, people ultimately did not want to receive these cards. And we can see this in practice too. Um, for example, BISC uh, is a decentralized exchange where the most common pair is Monero to Bitcoin and, uh, and vice versa, of course. And uh, Monero typically trades for a premium there because they don't have, a, there's not a, an idea really of tainted Monero, but there is an idea of tainted Bitcoin. So users are selling their Monero for more there because they're concerned about receiving tainted Bitcoin than they are in like a, a centralized exchange that does a lot of work to make sure users aren't, uh, you know, receiving tainted funds, let's say. Um, but in reality, like, even though we had this lovely example where everyone's going around the room, who among the attendees is actually paying for Chainalysis or another analysis software in order to see information about what funds are bad? No user pays for this. When was the last time you were at a Bitcoin meetup and someone was going to give you like a test amount of Bitcoin or something as just a means of testing out a transaction? Did you run their funds through some analysis software to make sure that they weren't like illegitimate or illicit? You probably didn't. But if you send those funds to an exchange, they're going to look, they're going to do that. So uh, this really is like, even though it impacts businesses in a way that's unfortunate because they need to pay for these tools, Ultimately, users are the ones that are most at risk because they don't have a, a strong ability to protect themselves. Um, so whenever you're talking about like the actual implementation of a privacy feature, I actually like to think about, okay, is the privacy feature good enough that, and widely implemented enough that you will accept any funds on the network um, you know, without worrying about there being an on-chain record that's associating you with it. And if the answer is no, then you need to worry about fungibility in your network. Your coins aren't really equal. Um, like I will accept any $10 bill that is paid for you know, an otherwise legal transaction, but I wouldn't necessarily accept $10 in Bitcoin because some Bitcoin is very clearly marked with you know, previous uh, or potential future um, nefarious activity. So you have to be really careful. In reality, what happens is that chain analysis companies will most likely mark the use of any optional privacy also as higher risk. This is enforced by several tools. Um, recently, Elliptic um, and Chainalysis announced that they uh, have support for Zcash. Others supported like Dash and like a few other coins too, um, where if you use the privacy features of these coins, they will be marked as higher risk by exchanges. So if you like take your Zcash, and um, send it shielded to an exchange, they're going to receive, receive a report that says, hey, this is a higher risk deposit because it's associated with the privacy tool. Um, that's reliable because very few people use the privacy feature. So they're able to mark the very few users who take advantage of that privacy feature. Um, um, and so optional privacy usually actually harms fungibility. It typically doesn't help. Um, you know, one of these red dots on these cards, for example, will just be the use of privacy features in general. We'll just mark the whole pool as bad. That's just the way the, the ecosystem currently works. And I can speak from firsthand experience, having worked for a market making firm where we, we deal with OTC counterparties, and we also onboard with dozens of exchanges. So I'm familiar, we have to be familiar with all of their, um, their deposit policies. So, uh, you know, in the industry, everybody's marking these things. <laughs> That's just the reality of how it works. Um, and so it is a substantial problem in the industry where if you are not transacting with an exchange, like it's almost suspicious just because everyone's uh, trying to make money on the exchanges and sending funds between exchanges. So almost anything else is odd. It's unusual. People aren't often using Bitcoin in non-custodial wallets to send to other non-custodial wallets. It's, it's kind of odd. So now that I've gotten out the whole, like, what is privacy and what is fungibility thing, what is Monero? Um, so Monero is a community-driven open source project, just like Bitcoin in both of those cases, that makes safe digital cash and owns up to its shortcomings. It's kind of weird for me to put the last one in there, but I really want to emphasize that in the Monero community, we are constantly focused on how to break the system, how to make it better, 
And if there's a limitation, we are the first to typically acknowledge that our system is limited and we are trying to find ways to improve it. And we wanna communicate those shortcomings if they exist. So we try to be as open as possible with what our limitations are. We are not going out saying that our privacy solution is the perfect solution to anything. But as you will see, Monero is really the only privacy implementation that provides any sort of protection against mass surveillance for its users where it has a single degree of base level privacy where most systems don't provide anything for casual users. So you may have run into a Monero enthusiast like this if you've heard of Monero before and we apologize where someone says like, has anyone mentioned a traceable public ledger or any privacy feature or anything at all? You'll typically have someone from Monero that barges their way in there and is like, privacy is important. You got to make it default. You got to do this. You got to do that. And like, we're sorry. <laughs> but at the same time, like very few people in the ecosystem are the ones that are constantly championing this stuff. You'll have a new project that comes out, like, uh, you know, DeFi is really sexy right now. It's a new fancy thing everyone's talking about. But who in the room is the person that's like, okay, is privacy an integral focus of, of your platform or is it just an afterthought, right? It's not just Monero enthusiasts that are the individuals that are coming out there arguing about why you should use Monero. Honestly, most of the time we don't care. Ultimately, we're just trying to get people to care about privacy and coin equality. In, in general, mo we feel most people don't take these problems very seriously. Um, and they're often severely just ignored to the severe detriment of its users and of the ecosystem as a whole. So um, you often see Monero enthusiasts like this barge their way in. Um, so what are some real problems that Monero actually addresses? Um, so first, what it's best known for, it provides strong, ubiquitous privacy. So every single person who sends a Monero transaction by default and mandate on chain, it always hides the sender receiver and amount. There is no other coin other than tiny forks of Monero where you can say that that's the case. Nothing else. No matter what transaction you send, no matter where you send it from, no matter what wallet you, you're using, on-chain, it has a sender receiver and amount. Um, it also has coin equality as a result where you receive funds and there is no idea of knowing what previous address it's associated with. You don't know what past history it's associated with. Of course, when you're engaging in a transaction, you should know something about the transaction you're engaging in to make sure you're not receiving funds from, let's say, North Korea. But there's no on-chain connection, and you are therefore provided a much higher degree of coin equality in this system, where as a recipient, you really don't need to care that much. And that's awesome. You don't need to pay for like this incredibly obnoxious software that, um, you know, has a bunch of other downsides and, and users aren't likely to pay for it. Um, it also has an accessible proof of work mining algorithm. It's currently called RandomX. I'll talk about that in the next slide here. And it has an adaptive block size and fees, which I won't really talk about in this presentation, um, but there is no hard cap to the block size of Monero. Um, instead, the size and fees are dynamic in a model that penalizes from the block reward if blocks get too large. So, um, you know, it, it's capped at a certain growth rate and there is a, a disadvantage for increasing the block size. However, there is no like hard cap of like one megabyte or something like that. So on the first one, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, um, the proof of work mining algorithm, Monero's had a weird history. You may have heard of Monero from this, uh, from this whole debacle too. Uh, Monero launched with, a version of its white paper, sorry, a version of a mining algorithm called Kryptonite. Um, Kryptonite was memory intensive. It was supposed to be ASIC resistant. It seemed to work, honestly, for the first few years. But in 2017, when the ecosystem really exploded, there was a lot more attention on cryptocurrencies. There was a lot more money on, in cryptocurrencies. It drew the attention of ASIC manufacturers really for the first time. And they gave the they gave the algorithm a really good run for its money, and to ultimately shoved it over. Right? It was not very effective actually at preventing um, at preventing uh, ASICs from being on the network. You can see there the, the substantial growth in hash hash rate, um, especially after January 2019. Even as the prices were were going down, the hash rate was still going up pretty significantly. 
So uh, Monero decided that instead of just accepting these ASICs on the network who were mining secretly, we needed no idea at the moment uh, who the uh, manufacturers were of these ASICs. Uh, this is this is a very common pro problem for, for smaller coins of proof of work uh, mechanisms. Uh, Monero decided to tweak the algorithm just to break the existing ASICs, and it did this three times. So it, it tweaked it from you know the original kryptonite to a variant one, then to a variant two. Um, on variant two, it was obvious that near the end there were ASICs on the network, even over that really short time period. Uh, they, it was, you know, manufacturers can design and ship out ASICs in like three months. So uh, we thought it would originally take closer to a year, uh, but really it's more like three months. Um, and then uh, there was a Kryptonite R, which had a, a larger random element to make it a little bit more difficult. But ultimately, we all knew that this algorithm would not provide uh, permanent protection against ASICs and would be inevitable if someone eventually making one for Kryptonite R would have happened. Um, so the community started from a ground up rebuild of the idea of a, an accessible CPU based proof of work mining algorithm. Um, ultimately, came up with the idea of RandomX. RandomX is what is currently implemented. Um, you see on the right there a substantial hash rate increase. I mean, these algorithms are all different, so you can't just very obviously compare one hash against another. So, one hash of RandomX is not the same effort as one hash of Kryptonite R. Uh, you know. So you can't just be like, oh, the network's much more secure because the hash rate's higher. No, it's, it's not how it works. Uh, however, uh, RandomX uses a completely different system compared to Kryptonite to have randomly generated like code that you have to uh, have to create and do on your end. So it, it's very obviously tailored towards CPUs. And even though uh, we expect that someone can design special compute units that are slightly more efficient uh, than you know, standard out-of-the-box out CPUs, they're still competing against a pretty developed and competitive market that's widely distributed. And there's a bunch of other economic factors at play. So we're hoping that uh, you know, RandomX will hold out pretty well. Uh, granted, if it doesn't, then Monero will not go back to the whole tweaking thing as it did before, because that was just upgrade nightmare. Uh, so instead, Monero will just switch to an ASIC-friendly algorithm if RandomX proves to not be uh, useful in accomplishing its initial goals. Um, we hope that doesn't happen, but we are prepared for that situation if it does occur. So if you have questions about Monero's proof-of-work mechanism, about, uh, about proof-of-work in general on small coins, Monero is usually one of the best examples you can point to just because it's had a very, very active history. Um, and it has tried things a lot of other coins haven't done, especially for a coin of its size. You don't hear of coins in the you know, multi-billion dollar market cap changing its uh, proof of work algorithm very often. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. So um, talking about Monero's governance, Monero's governance is a little weird. Just to be really clear, there is no company or foundation behind Monero. There is like no founder's award that goes anywhere. There is no additional fee that goes to anybody it's like bitcoin in that there's no direct group of people behind it it's just a, a community that gets together to solve these problems and it's not like there's a certain company or, or foundation that is tasked with the maintenance of this ecosystem so it's the governance is really broken up and wherever people communicate but in general it's like these four things um so first the Monero Project GitHub is, is really the, the main place where discussions happen. You can have discussion on issues and pull requests. Uh, the very common repos are Monero, Monero GUI, uh, uh, Monero, apparently I repeated twice, Monero Sites is what I meant to say, uh, Meta and Research Lab. Uh, that's where you can post a lot of, uh, lot of discussions. And um, it's good for wherever you need like a permanent record of someone stating something. GitHub's pretty good for that. We also have meetings. Um, there's dev meetings every two weeks usually. There are community meetings every two weeks. There's coffee chats, which are casual video calls every four weeks. Um, there's Monero Research Lab meetings every week and then other meetings as needed. That's where, like if, if we've talked about things in a GitHub issue or if we want to introduce something for a new time, we might talk about that during meeting time just to get the ideas out there, especially during the Monero Research Lab meetings just because they're, they're weekly. Um, also, we have the Monero subreddit. Those are good for more casual conversations, receiving wide community feedback. And even so, like 
sometimes people have really, really good proposals that they make on a subreddit and then those make their way over to meetings or GitHub issues. They make their way to more formal platforms, but it's a good way to help get people to prompt out casual ideas. Uh, and then we have a Monero core team. This is as close to official as you're gonna get. It's seven members uh, who maintain the critical infrastructure like the Monero website, these sort of things that can't really be decentralized. Uh, you need some entity or individual there that does the registration and pays for the server. So they're the ones that do that. Uh, they participate in community meetings and offer advice. Uh, they, they, I mean, of course, they've been around for a long time in the Monero ecosystem, typically offer very good advice. Uh, but they do not determine consensus changes. They do not dictate the discussions. Um, you know, the, the dev meetings are run by other people. The, the community meetings are run by other people like me, right? It, like the, the core team members are not the ones that are actually doing this work. So um, it's a very distributed governance not model. There's no on-chain voting. There's no, you know, anything that's incredibly formal. Instead, it's just a very arduous uh, communicate, like. Um, feedback process, idea proposition process, and typically the, the noise is filtered through meetings, through GitHub comments, and the, the good ideas are selected during meetings and then implemented in, in a privacy protocol, um, or in a protocol implementation. So the community is very diverse as a result, because of course you don't have, uh, like besides the official Monero website, you don't have like official really anything. Um, there is a subreddit that is very popular. There is like, a, you know, People are pop common on are commonly posting on, on Twitter and things. Uh, there are Telegram groups. There's a Discord group. Um, most discussion happens on IRC. Actually, I did not use IRC until the beginning of 2017 when I wanted to have community meetings, and uh, so I was a, a bit of a late adopter. But a lot of the Monero community is still on IRC. Uh, there are bridges, so you don't actually have to use IRC to communicate with people on those IRC channels. But at its core. Monero still uses a lot of IRC channels. Uh, also, um, you know, there's very various like other aspects you can participate in the community. But if you just want to join in and, and follow common news, the subreddit is a really easy way to do that. That's just r slash Monero. And there's other, like I said, Telegram, Discord, IRC groups. If you are interested in a more uh, like chat like uh, communication. So in order to raise money, since there is no Founders Award, uh, pre-mine, you know, any of those sort of things, Monero needs to rely on begging people for money. So they use donation systems. Um, so you can donate straight to the Monero project in the upper right-hand corner, there's that donate button. But um, people who want to raise money for a specific task can go through, propose an idea, uh, it receives general community discussion if it's considered a good idea and meets basic requirements. It proceeds to funding required where people can donate to these ideas. And then uh, once these ideas are actually materialized or completed, people can receive donations as a result uh, from these systems. So but it used to be called the, uh, the form funding system, the FFS, but we realized it stood for something else. So we renamed it to the community crowdfunding system, which we think is a better name anyway. And uh, yeah, so instead of people receiving money from like, uh, Again, no founders award or anything. There's no company that just dictates what people do. Instead, people who want to work on the project will pitch an idea, and if it's good, they will open it up for funding, they'll receive funding, and ultimately get those distributions if they complete their tasks. So that, that's how the uh, crowdfunding system works. We've actually seen other coins like ZeroCoin and to some extent Zcash uh, Foundation 2 uh, emulate the crowdfunding system with other sorts of uh, very, very similar systems. Um, switching gears here, I guess, uh, I want to point out that uh, safety really is paramount in these systems because you're designing these decentralized network that anyone can try and attack and, and, and manipulate. So you have to be really, really careful, especially when you are touching privacy because it makes things more obfuscated and sometimes it makes things a little less clear <laughs> about what's going on, right? As is the intent of the privacy in general. Um, so the Monero community has worked with a large number of auditors in order to audit various aspects of its code base. Um, for example, Monero implemented bulletproofs, which substan which um, is, is a general purpose zero knowledge scheme, right? <laughs> Again, the cryptography term. 
um, which Monero uses to hide the amounts in its transactions. Um, but, uh, you know, it was audited by two security firms with random X of proof of work algorithm. We had that audited by four different groups. Um, and CLSAG, which is a, a 2B implementation, um, uh, like a more efficient version of Monero ring signatures, which I'll get to really shortly, um, that is almost, that, that's um, also being on, audited. Uh, that audit, uh, those, those results are, are very nearly public. Um, and then it will be implemented uh, soon after. Um, so Monero takes like the security of the network really, really critically. And I think that there are other projects that are stepping up their game and are doing more security testing of their products. It's no longer 2017, I hope, where you can just put anything out and just hope it doesn't break. People are increasingly expecting that you do some testing to help point out why it is secure, why it is safe, like who actually stands by it. And so uh, th that's obviously even more important in, in privacy focused systems. Regarding the monetary supply, there are no happenings. Uh, instead, it's just a continuous decrease um, until about 2022, 2023, at which point something called a tail emission kicks in. So the tail emission is a permanent issuance of 0 0.3 Monero per minute. So, um, you know, technically Monero supply is infinite but it is disinflationary, it is predictable, we all know what it's gonna look like, and Monero will have fewer coins in Bitcoin until like about 2040, right? So, um, yeah, <laughs> the, it, it's, um, it's important that Monero have a constant issuance in order to incentivize mining beyond fees, uh, just because that way we will always have a penalty for miners if they do not, uh, mine according to the way we want to, we can just withhold the found, we can just withhold uh, this, um, this block reward, um, which we can't necessarily withhold from fees because those are provided by the users. So it provides us with an additional security option uh, going forward into the future. But you can see at the moment, uh, you know, there's similar uh, supplies of Monero and Bitcoin, and even their inflation rates are, are pretty similar at the moment. Okay, now to talk about the really fun stuff, the Monero transaction topology. What do Monero transactions look like? First, I wanna emphasize the idea of outputs or notes. Um, you know, a lot of people call them outputs. It's a really bad name. You should think of them as like dollar bills or what I have pictured here, um, pots of gold or pots of Monero. <laughs> They're single use like pots of something. And uh, when you set, spend these pots, what you do is you take your pot, you make a new pot and you dump however many coins you want to go to that recipient in that pot. Uh, and you create, like, since they're single use, you don't uh, get to just take a few out and give the pot to someone else. Um, these outputs are not tied to addresses in Monero at all. They are really not tied to, like, you don't even think about them as tied to an individual, even though that is the case in practice. The network level doesn't really care. So you can think about them as just being tied to the transactions that they are created in, and that, that's really the best way. So this output was created in this transaction. That is the best anchor for those outputs. Um, and then when you spend outputs, what you do is you take one output that you actually are spending, and you will combine it with several other outputs from the blockchain that other users control, uh, but you don't need their permission, you don't need their cooperation, you don't need to interact with them at all in any way. All you need to do is look at a copy of the blockchain, which you can do offline even, pull in some of these other outputs and make it seem as if there are 11 outputs total being spent um, for every one you're spending. So it will say like a ring size of 11. So ultimately what that means is every time you're spending funds, you are adding in 10 other sources of possible funds that could be spent and then creating a signature based off that. So it appears as if any one of those 11 could be possible sources of funds that are spent. Also keep in mind that there are, these outputs are not connections to individuals. So it's not saying this individual or among 10, 10 other individuals is, um, is the possible spender. Instead it's saying this output, which is created to this, connected to this transaction um, is one of, 10, sorry, one of 11 possible spends. So I know that's probably a clunky way to try and explain it, but ultimately there, there's, 
like there's ambiguity in terms of what the actual source of funds is that's being sent. If you are sending several outputs, each output will have its own ring signature. So each output has its own set of 10 other outputs that are connected with it, one of which is real, 11 of which are fake or decoys. They are not known to the rest of the network to be fake, but they uh, uh, are known to the sender to be fake. And then that ultimately results in new outputs being created on the right-hand side there. Uh, there are at least two per transaction, otherwise you would know that it was like a sweep of all of those inputs. Uh, and uh, typically it looks like one output going to the recipient, one back to the receiver as change. Um, it's typically how that works. So that's in general how the transaction topology works. Um, the amounts are hidden throughout all this process because of ring CT. So you do not get to see the amounts are, are being transacted either. In Monero's very early history, the amounts were denominated. Um, so it was like broken down into 0.1 and 0.5, and you can only choose decoys that were of the same amount. Really, like Monero's early privacy is far worse than it is right now. Like, and I don't think there are enough research papers looking into just how bad uh, denominated outputs were for Monero in the past. I'm sure they were truly horrible. Um, so it's good that we don't need to worry about that at all. It simplifies a lot of our uh, privacy processes. So just to emphasize what this looks like on like the blockchain level, let's say on the left-hand side there, um, through the viewer of the actual sender, they know that they are sending these orange outputs. These are the real outputs of the ring that are being spent. The purple ones are all the decoys or the ones that they do not control. Um, so they, they know that the value of the first ring is signature that they're sending is 10 Monero and the second one is five. But for all the decoys, they have no idea what these amounts are, right? And they do know that they're sending 12 Monero to a recipient and receiving three back and change. If you're the person that's signing this transaction, of course, you know that information. But if you look through the attacker's point of view, they have no idea whose outputs are whose. They don't know how, what the amounts are. All they know is the value of their specific output. Let's say this one red one of 100 XMR that is owned by the attacker. Well, they do know what transactions include that in their ring, but they don't know anything else about the transaction. So you can see, an attacker would need to control a very substantial number of outputs in order to have any sort of reliable oversight over the network. They would need to have over the majority of total Monero outputs to have any sort of substantial impact to the network. Um, and uh, that's also mitigated by increasing the ring size, right? Because of course, then the likelihood that they're going to impact all the rings is, is very, very low. So to emphasize it here too, if you have a given output that you're trying to trace, it will appear in several different transactions, several different ring signatures as being possible spends. So if you're trying to trace a specific output, say I took my output, sent it to someone else, and I'm trying to look for what happens with that future output. Well, there's going to be like 11 or so transactions that all appear to spend that output. And these are all also tied to not a specific recipient or anything, so it is in practice really, really difficult to follow. So um, that's why every single hop that you make, it, it, it's increasingly difficult to try and trace Monero transactions, and uh, why we say that Monero provides a really high degree of mass surveillance protection because every single user is helping to contribute to these protections and they're receiving a substantial portion of these protections. To simplify, you can think of Bitcoin transaction signing as just one person. With, without a face covering, very clearly signing a piece of paper. With Monero, you have a bunch of people behind a table, each with their, their you know, face masks, all like reaching under a table and one person is signing, but you don't know who it is. Um, of course, I wanna emphasize that with Monero, it is a non-interactive process. So you don't actually need three other people to be here. Instead, it's almost like you put very convincing cardboard cutouts of, of 10 other people there. And then you reach your hand under the table. <laughs> that's, that's really what it more looks like in practice. Um, so that's a lot about the actual transactions on chain. However, of course, you need to worry about how you are leaking network information to get it there. Um, so Monero has implemented something called Dandelion++. Plus Plus. Um, you can also use Monero with Tor and I2P. There are integrations available uh, with the Node and Wallet software uh, for the command line at the moment only. Um, 
but every single user will benefit from Dandelion++ if they're using uh, like a, a common wallet. Uh, so in the past, what happened on the ClearNet is nodes would just flood information out there. So they would connect to a bunch of nodes. And if, if you wanted to send a transaction, you would tell every single person you were connected to about these transactions. That is efficient because it like gets the transaction out to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. But it doesn't mean that all of those nodes like know your IP. They, they know this transaction came from you. They don't necessarily know you were the origin of it. You might have just been relaying the transaction. However, since like if an attacker is operating many nodes and they receive the same transaction from several, from a single node, uh, they're probably going to, with high reliability, know that it came from one participant. Um, however, with Dandelion++, instead it breaks us down into a stem and like a, a broadcast phase. Um, so uh, to begin with, you'll just send it to like a set of predefined other nodes that you select. And then once it gets a few hops out, then it will spread like wildfire and will we'll get out as quickly as it can. So that helps reduce the exposure. Um, there's been a lot of research on Dandelion at this point. Um, Monero implemented Dandelion++, which was obviously a, a later revised version of the original Dandelion uh, networking uh, proposal. Um, but this is implemented right now and users are already receiving a high degree of additional network protections. Of course, if you are one of those power users, you should still use Tor and I2P, but this is one of the things that helps everybody even if you aren't running Tor or I2P. So it's an example of something that's really awesome for a large number of people that aren't enthusiasts. <laughs> so um, I guess to, to sort of summarize the level of protections that Monero provides, it, it, it's differentiated from all the other coins because it provides all of these protections to everybody. I haven't described the sort of on or off opt-in feature. These are enabled for every single person on the network. So what I really like to emphasize, these are systems that ultimately, that ultimately we're making for people to use. They aren't just research projects that we are hypothesizing how a theoretical person might maybe get privacy. No, these are systems that people are using and we hope that people are getting these privacy uh, you know, benefits from them. So uh, I like to say that Monero has real privacy, not potential privacy. You know, it's fun to talk about all these potential privacy. It's fun in like a startup context to talk about how potential growth they have instead of actual like revenue or anything. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we're trying to devise systems where people have real protections. And time and time again, Monero really is the only one that's, you know, sadly actually providing privacy protections to really any, any of its users. And I'm going to show a few numbers just to show that. So, you know, Monero compared to Zcash, which Zcash is typically considered like the main competitor in a way, if you even are like one coin competing against the other type person, which I'm not really. Um, you just look at the proportion of shielded transactions that hide the sender, receiver, and amount for Zcash and Monero. It's night and day, right? Like, <laughs> you barely can see the other, other projects, right? And Zcash is very clearly the, the second largest. Like, other coins do not provide substantial degrees of privacy. Um, and Monero is really the only coin where any of its transactions hide the sender or receiver an amount. Just to show this in a different way, um, I have a black line here on the bottom. That is the total sum of every single number of Zcash transactions that have hit the sender, receiver, and amount. Um, and then those are the, in yellow, blue, and red, those are the number of Monero transactions per month, so for a given month, that hide this information. You can see it's substantially larger. There are like 100 times more Monero transactions that hide the sender, receiver, and amount in Zcash, right? So... Since February 2017, Monero has had more transactions each month that hide this information than Zcash has had in its entire three and a half year history. So it's really sad. And the point of this isn't just to say that Zcash sucks, right? Like they have a really interesting privacy pr protocol, but ultimately at the end of the day, we're building systems that people use. And Monero is the only system that seems to have cared about the implementation of privacy solutions for people to actually use. So I know I'm, you know, being pretty aggressive here at, at promoting Monero, but like the point is, 
the like the fact is no one else has really pursued the implementation of a privacy feature as much they've just offered a feature and hope that people adopt it and time and time again no one has and it's been really really dangerous for the ecosystem looking at bitcoin for example this is the adoption of samurai wallet samurai mixing rounds and even if you generously stack them together you get about 8,700 tra peak transactions per month that hit that um that like opted in to hide this information, right? And even though the transaction amounts are not comparable, because you have mixing rounds versus individual sending transactions and these sort of things, this is still a tenth of the lowest Monero monthly volume in the past year. And this is for one of the two leading privacy solutions for Bitcoin. Right, Bitcoin is a much bigger network, but you still do not see uptake in privacy at nearly the same scale, even on the same gross scale, even if you don't even think about comparative, like proportional scale, on a gross scale, it's still significantly less. So it doesn't actually matter how like big the network is or the fact that a, a really interesting privacy solution is potentially available for users, you need to actually focus about how it's actually implemented um, it, it, it's critically important or else you do have all the same issues that Bitcoin has, right? Like, is, like what even is a privacy coin, I guess? Is it just a coin that has an optional privacy feature? Because then, you know, Bitcoin's a privacy coin, right? So uh, we need to be really, really careful about how we build privacy into systems. Um, okay, so that little monologue over. Transparency still is important for the right people. I don't think it's appropriate to say that if you want to reveal information to people, you need to send a, a transaction for everyone, like the whole public to see. Um, instead, uh, sorry, I'll pull up the chat here. I didn't have the chat pulled up. Um, okay, I can't quite see the chat, sadly. Um, so I don't think it's appropriate to say that uh, you could either reveal all the information to the whole public or you can keep it all private. Um, there has to be some middle ground. And so Monero has something called a view key. So by default, it hides a sender receiver and amount from everybody, but transparency is important to the right people. You don't want, sorry, I said that a second time. Um, but conversely, you might not want to reveal information like the sender receiver and amount to literally everybody. You might want to instead just reveal it to a certain number of people. So what you can give out is this thing called a view key. For Monero, it just reveals the sender of transactions that you make. So it's like, hey, yes, you did make these transactions. Um, but if you also provide key images, it also shows the receiver and amount that is sent in those transactions. So you can give this information to individuals or entities or you know, anybody that you want. Um, and they will have some level of oversight over your transactions, but the rest of the network critically still does not. So the rest of the network, it's still all obfuscated. So you are selectively revealing information to people. It is not accurate to say like all Monero transactions are always hidden from everybody and there's no way to change that. By default, on the network level, they're hidden, but you can still provide information to reveal information about these transactions. Just like you as a signer of a, a, a transaction know what uh, transactions you're receiving in your wallet even if the rest of the network doesn't know what transactions you're actually receiving. So, finally done with most of the Monero stuff. Now to talk about, tr uh, trace. I said trading, oops. Basic tracing methods crash course. We're not, we're not here to talk about how to get rich. This is how you can trace people. So, uh, the first really obvious method for tracing is just following the outputs, right? User A sent money to user B. There's no ambiguity about what users were involved. It's just this output went from one address to another address. If you've ever looked at a Bitcoin block explorer, you will see this information. It'll just say these addresses sent money to these other addresses. So think about that as like your really simple tracing method one. Just follow where the outputs are going. Um, you'd be surprised how common this is in the industry of tracing. This is, this is the most common method people tracing is just by following what addresses funds are sent from back and forth. Um, of course, this is not possible with Monero, but it is possible with the vast majority of coins out there. Um, and I guess just to emphasize in Ethereum's case, which is not output-based, but it's address-based, you'll just see a, a similar heuristic or, or method would simply be follow the 
uh, transfer of amounts between addresses rather than outputs. But, you know, they're very similar. So tracing method two, this one's specific to Monero. Um, let's say uh, you have this ring signature. I only made this one with seven just for space uh, saving reasons. Uh, so seven outputs uh, in the ring. And um, you also have other transactions that do not have any decoys in their ring. This is no longer the case for Monero. It has not been for a long time, but when Monero first launched, you could send a transaction without any decoys. So effectively we're saying this one output was the only output that could have possibly spent this, uh, spent this output. Uh, now this impacted other transactions because if, if, if you know on one hand, this specific output is known to be spent in one transaction. And on the other hand, it, um, it is claimed that this output is used in the other transaction. Well, you know that claim is false, right? You have a, a, a signature that very clearly shows that it is spent on this one transaction, so it cannot be spent anywhere else. So let's say like this one um, you know, transaction here, let's say, uh, so like, if I pull up the laser pointer here, right, you have this one transaction here um, that was created in transaction one. Well, this same output could not have been used here with the X. So we can remove that. That's not a convincing decoy. We know that's false. And if you repeat this several times for like a substantial number of other transactions, right, we might be able to say, hey, we get to cross all these other ones out. Now there's only one left. That's the obvious true spend. So then we get to compromise this decoy, and now we know any transaction subsequent that uses uh, tr this output will also be known to be false. So let's make this other ring over here. This output here, let's say it was the one in the ring in the left here. This one is no longer, uh, is no longer convincing spend. Um, this is the idea of a chain reaction, where a ring that originally had decoys is broken down, and now it also impacts other decoys. This isn't really a concern of Monero anymore. Um, we've made large enough ring sizes where I'm confident saying that this is a solved problem, but it is still important to understand how these chain reactions work um, because a bunch of other attacks stem off of this basic idea where ultimately at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is uh, learn information about outputs such that you can convincingly remove them from rings trying to find out what real output is actually being spent in these rings. That's ultimately the same shared idea. So it's, it's, a use, sorry, it's useful to understand this really basic example. Tracing method three, the poisoned output or EAE attack. This one's also on Monero. This one's pretty cool. So let's say that Eve is, um, Eve is a user, sends font, is it a colluding user? Let's say Eve like could be an exchange or just someone that colludes with another exchange, uh, sends money to a specific user and then is trying to learn information about that user to see if, if they send funds to an exchange. Let's say that this user, 43W1W, the one who controls the dress, is known to the exchange as being the identity Alice. Like this is a KYC exchange. So Eve, let's say, send trans sends transactions to Alice. The first transaction, you know, transaction uh, goes to this Alice. This, this output goes to Alice. There's a, like three transactions that all use this decoy in the ring, one of which, though, goes to this exchange, right, under Alice's identity. So, uh, you know, it could be you know, seen that Alice likely was the one who sent the funds to an exchange, was likely the owner of this address, because the likelihood that Alice controlled this address or you know, was able to send this transaction with this specific decoy is relatively low based off complete random chance. However, if this only happens once, you know, there's still a decent degree of probability. Like it could be anyone's output that was selected. Alice may have just selected this A as a decoy. Who knows that it actually was a real spend in this transaction, right? There's a decent amount of ambiguity. However, if you repeat this several times, so a second time and a third time and a fourth time, right? Now, even the exchange can be pretty convinced that this did not happen by chance, that every time Eve sent money to Alice and then Alice sent it to the exchange, like Alice probably isn't selecting all these decoys by complete chance, just based off the amount of times it's happened. So this is um, 
sometimes called the EAE attack or the poison output attack where someone gives you an output and is trying to uh, watch it. And they're trying to watch potentially several outputs they're giving you. Um, the more outputs they give you and have oversight over, the better chance they have at trying to trace you. So um, Monero provides a high degree of protection against mass surveillance. When it comes to very specific attacks like these, um, you know, you need to be really careful as a user. <laughs> so, you know, the Monero community spends, you know, all day, every day thinking about how to come up with attacks like these. And then we try to communicate them to users about how to be really careful. Um, but ultimately with Monero's privacy protections, you need to be really careful when you are interfacing with two malicious entities, um, especially if they're on both sides of the transaction. Uh, be really careful. Um, similarly, let's say that like you made a single transaction that uh, spent A, B, C, and D all in the same ring. Uh, that similarly would provide a, a high degree of evidence, even if it's just in a single transaction, just because the likelihood all four of these rings each contained all four of these outputs is, is quite low. So um, that's something to, to, to look at. Um, if you are interested, we have a, I have an episode on this specifically. Um, it's called Breaking Monero. Um, and I talk about the specific limitations here. Um, but um, uh, what do I want to get out here? Oh, like here it's, if, let's say there's like additional levels, like there's additional transactions and uh, like these funds aren't directly sent to exchanges. There's like a, an additional degree of, of transactions stored in the middle. You can still see that, uh, you know, Al Alice likely sent funds to the exchange and likely was a recipient to these funds. However, there's all these additional transactions and therefore it's, it's less likely that it happened by chance. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that further down the line, um, the statistical test gets worse. It's not like you don't know with 100% certainty that these things are happening. You just have a really high degree of information such that you can get like a subpoena or a warrant or something, right? Um, so we look at how you can trace, even like if, even if there's one set of transactions in the middle here, again, only three transactions each. In reality, there'd be a lot more. Um, but like, you know, A sends funds to like one, you know, one of their other addresses first, and then uh, they send funds to the exchange. It, it adds all these additional transactions in the mix, all these other outputs that could be selected. And it's less likely that these things occur just by chance. Uh, because you are encompassing a much wider potential scope of network activity. So um, the point of this slide is just to show that the statistical test gets uh, worse when you have other noise in there, as you can imagine. So tracing method four, what I'm calling just the tip, uh, pool use. Um, it's actually called Quesnel analysis. Um, so the idea with Zcash especially is you have this pool, this, this pool of shielded coins. This is your pool of privacy, right? Well, if you start from a transparent system, chuck in a certain amount, you know, just, just dip it in the pool, and then you pull out very similar amount or the same amount back to the transparent pool, you're still associated with a very high degree of probability if unique amounts are used, and especially if they're uh, done at similar times. So even though you are interacting with the system, that has a very high degree of graph uh, transaction or transaction graph privacy. Um, it doesn't matter because the amounts are public. And so uh, there's this research paper that specifically looked at Zcash users and how they were interacting with this pool. And a lot of people were not interacting with it very cleverly. They were making a bunch of very simple mistakes. Um, so this is another example. Look at the amounts. If you can look at the amounts, there's a ton of information you can trace. This is not just the case for Zcash, is the case for really any coin with transparent amounts. Um, it, it's quite exciting. Um, with, with, with like Bitcoin mixing, for example, even when denominated, people will look at the amounts. Um, like let's say you're trying to launder like a billion dollars you stole in a hack uh, of Bitcoin, right? It's hard to do just because the amount is so transparent, right? Like how are you gonna hide that even with a, an otherwise good system? Um, it, it's, it's useful to trace the amounts. Um, if this did excite you, the idea of just like showing you example attacks, uh, I want to stress that in the Monero community and you know other privacy-focused communities, 
people will spend all day just doing nothing but thinking of these potential attacks. Um, I, um, one person named uh, Mitchell has this wonderful MoneroCon talk where he talked about how various points of metadata that you don't even typically think about uh, can be used to help identify specific users and why we can enforce certain uh, best practices on the protocol level that prevent these bad behaviors. So we're actually taking steps to prevent users from making these mistakes or using wallets that screw them over. Um, also, I had a series called Breaking Monero that uh, tries to explore these vulnerabilities, explains them to people. Um, we make posts about what the actual limitations are before we're able to fix them, like we did for uh, sub addresses. And then there's a bunch of research papers about how like how chain reactions work, let's say, or how uh, we get to improve obfuscation, and, you know, a bunch of other ways that we get to try and make privacy is better, uh, describe attacks. Ultimately, we try to be as open as possible such that we can let users know what type of system they're using to the best extent we can, but even that isn't a great solution because ultimately we need to fix it on a protocol level. It needs to be more than just education. So getting into the summary part, <laughs> privacy isn't always easy or clear or efficient or even the first priority of a network, but it is critical that you focus on these things, otherwise, you might have a substantial number of disadvantages. Suppose you're making like a DeFi exchange system, right? How are you preventing your users from receiving tainted coins? If you're using a transparent asset, you're probably not, right? Users who use your system might be much more liable than if they use a centralized exchange. They might receive funds that they can't do anything with. So privacy is really, really important. Um, and it's at odds sometimes with certain goals but at the same time, it is a very important goal on its own and deserves its own seat at the talk at the table for the very first protocol discussions. If you are trying to work its way in later, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it, it won't work. We, we've never seen someone just add it and have it work as an afterthought. Um, it just doesn't. Um, so focus on the adopted protections, not just potential in a lab protections, what like what are we actually expecting users to do? So first, are people actually using the privacy features? What are we expecting them to do? Do users understand the common nuances? And is it reasonable to teach these nuances to people? Or are they like, do you need to sit through a 600 hour crash course? If that's if it's that, how do we expect anyone to actually use this properly, right? Is that reasonable to expect out of an open permissionless network? Um, are all coins equal? This is actually a really good indicator of whether the privacy features are well implemented because uh, coin equality is usually a consequence of well implemented privacy solutions where you don't need to worry about the source of funds because it's obfuscated, right? Um, and then how is the network handled in practice? Like, is it, um, is it something where users are actually adopting these features? Is it something where users are actually doing totally different things than you expect, you need to figure out how people are actually using these features, not just uh, how you hope people will use them. Um, here's an example about how, and a privacy feature being unachievable, right? On the Bitcoin privacy wiki, they outline an example of a perfectly private donation, which includes running Tor. Okay, that's already a large thing for many users, but that, that's, not, that's not the crazy part, right? You just need to download a few extra 100 gigabytes and let it run for a few extra days. Okay, fine, still a big ask for most people, but comparatively low. Okay, number four, solo mine a block. Okay, do you think it's reliable to solo mine Bitcoin blocks unless you're a mining pool? No, right? You can't reasonably ask someone to solo mine a block. If someone could predictably solo mine a block, they would have a substantial control over the network, right? Also then, destroy the, uh, the computer hardware used, right? I know that this is not necessarily a how-to guide that is going to be given to someone, but this is an example of something that is just completely out of reach for anybody, right? This is not something we can ask someone to do if they want to have privacy. We need to you know, think about reality and say, hey, this isn't a reasonable ask for anybody. We need easier user experiences for people to get privacy. If we're asking people to do anything even remotely similar to this, no one's gonna do it, right? All right, wrapping up here, what's next for, for Monero? Uh, today, as in like a few months ago now, uh, Monero added Dandelion++ that's like included in its most recent release. 
Um, in less than three months, um, Monero will implement CL SAG, which is a more efficient form of ring signatures. They will get about 15% more efficient, especially in verification. Um, a lot of people think that Monero transactions are large um, and that's their main downfall. The biggest shortcoming is actually the verification time. So this means like uh, if you're trying to sync a node um, or if you're running a node and you are trying to verify transactions that come in, that's actually like the biggest fear we have in the Monero community. And so we're really doing a lot of effort to make sure that they're as efficient as we can make them. Um, hopefully in about 12 months, large, like uh, larger ring sizes will come by like orders of magnitude. Um, the, you know, there's things like Arcturus, Triptych, Omni Ring, Ring CT 3.0. There's a lot of scientific research paper proposals at the moment. A lot of them might have test code at this point, but uh, ultimately they, they need more testing. Um, and then of course, final implementation before we can get much larger ring sizes that will help better protect against some of the uh, like EAE poison output attacks that I, I had described earlier. Um, so how should you participate, right? You can get educated. Uh, MasteringMonero.com has a free book. So if you want to read a free book, just download the PDF and, and learn some more there. Um, there's a movie, Monero Means Not Money. It actually was the number one movie in America for two days earlier this year because of COVID. Um, and for a week, it was number two. So if you want to watch the number one movie in America, you can watch that. Um, you can get started. If you want to download a wallet, Cake Wallet is one of the easiest to use. It's open source. It's free. It's available on iOS and Android. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Monero and get like the, the, the um, computer software, getmonero.org is the official website. And then if you want to join the community work group, uh, it's communityworkgroup.org. Um, that will show you information about when the meetings are. You can subscribe to calendar notifications, the whole like. Uh, that way you won't miss a meeting. In conclusion, privacy on a public permissionless network is really, really difficult to get right. It's so easy to screw up. There are way too many nuances. People spend their entire lives working on the stuff, and then it's still never perfect. Um, it's never a solved problem. Uh, Monero transactions use ring CT and stealth addresses to hide the sender, receiver, and amount for all transactions. Even Monero beginners have reasonably strong privacy. Um, Granted, it's not perfect privacy, but it's really, really good. Still, it's better than most other protocols, and it is always enabled. Um, focusing on coin equality rather than just optional privacy is usually a far more useful exercise than focusing on privacy. If you focus on coin equality, you typically also will get privacy as a result. It's almost like a, an additional next step level protection. Um, privacy needs to be thought of as a network implementation basis, not on just a single user basis. We can talk about like, you know, specific users being fantastic and being ninjas with their privacy, but that sucks. We don't want users to have to be ninjas with their privacy. We want users to be stupid and still be fine, right? That's the end goal. We want dumb users, which, I mean, let's face it, who wants to learn all the intricacies of having to use money? That's a dumb money if we can't have dumb users, right? So we, we need to think about how the network can actually implement best practices uh, for users to protect them. Uh, Monero is probably the only network that actually prevents mass surveillance. Everything else, you can track the vast majority of transactions. Um, watch for more efficient transactions soon and much larger ring sizes in the medium term future. Um, and then to conclude, again, attacks only get better. Attackers only get smarter, stronger, you need to have protocols that adapt the stuff over time. They cannot be stagnant. We need to stay ahead of attackers if we want any degree of reasonable protection. Okay, and with that, I am done. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm able to answer any questions if there is remaining time here. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Justin, for the very interesting presentation and for several of the points that you made in it. Like, for example, this problem of fungibility, uh, and also the fact that you have to uh, tackle privacy, not necessarily by tr attempting to tackle privacy, but by some other means that are more at the network level. I think that this is a very appreciated conclusion as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I know I have a question as well, but Eric had a previous one that, per that perhaps he can start. Yeah. yeah sorry, sorry for missing them during. I tried to pull up the chat in the middle and just it wasn't appearing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but um, often, um, 
often Monero, Zcash, and Dash are mentioned concurrently. And uh, in so many words, what would you say are the main differences between Dash and Monero? Sure. So um, Chainalysis recently announced support for Dash, and in Chainalysis's statement, they said that it was a bit of a misnomer to consider Dash a privacy coin. It offers optional mixing, optional coin join mixing, uh, like you can already get on Bitcoin. So, you know, it's, it's, it's integrated in wallets, um, but it, it's, it's similar to using like Samurai or Wasabi wallet for uh, Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, Dash has had this implemented for a long time. They've focused mostly on their instant send and they really haven't focused on their privacy features since inception. So even though it's often bundled in the privacy coin realm, you can get better privacy using Bitcoin mixers uh, than you can using Dash. So most people don't typically consider Dash to be a substantial privacy coin anymore. Um, and uh, you know that's different than Monero where instead of a mixing process with Dash, you have uh, an, a non-interactive uh, ring signature process. Very good, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And I had a question related to, um, let's say something that you said, and I wanted to see how the thing continues in a way, because um, you mentioned uh, rightfully that at the end of the day, uh, it is very hard to get uh, the mixers working properly in Bitcoin exactly because of the fact that they already, they already target a specific uh, audience inside of the community. And the question that I have, and I, I wanted to understand the, um, uh, the position of yours and uh, at the end of the day of the Monero community is whether uh, this does not apply as well to the whole privacy centric uh, cryptocurrencies there. I don't think so, but I wanted to understand what, it, what do you think about this? Sorry, whether what applies? Uh, the fact that at the end of the day, you, you say it, at the end of the day, um, the use of mixers and privacy-centric tools inside of Bitcoins is restricted to people that, in a, to an audience that in a way um, are engaged in a range of activities that already necessitate of these privacy-centric uh, measures. And therefore, specifically in the case of Bitcoin, for example, they, I, I may say they were already uh, uh, in the middle of, or they participated of illegal markets or dark web markets and so on and so forth. No, Whether that's Bitcoin a good question. does not apply still to the whole uh, range of privacy-centric cryptocurrencies. Now, that's a really good question, and I'm uh, to some extent that's true, right? Where if you are trying to engage in illicit activities or illegal activities, you're likely going to be encouraged to use a privacy coin in general. Um, we see that uh, people who are accepting payment in ransomware or for ransomware, let's say, are offering discounts for Monero compared to Bitcoin at this point. Um, however, you have to remember. Most people in cryptocurrencies are not using it to transact. They are using it as speculators. So mm -hmm. if you are using a Bitcoin mixer, let's say, if you're just speculating on the price of Bitcoin, you're probably not going to use a Bitcoin mixer, right? If you are mining Bitcoin, you're probably not going to use a Bitcoin mixer, right? However, if you're using a privacy coin where it's mandatory for you to participate with other users, then all of a sudden your pool of users is not just the illicit users anymore um, or the really uh, hardcore privacy advocates like you have in Bitcoin. Um, instead, it's broader and includes all of the speculators and all the miners, right? Monero has a, a very accessible proof of work mining algorithm where you can mine it on your CPU, right? And mm -hmm. that means that it's, uh, it's highly available to users. It's, it's often the coin that people mine. So if you're making Monero transactions, it could just be that you are interested in mining and this is the only coin you can mine, right? Mm -hmm. Or it could be that you are just trying to speculate on the price of Monero like you're trying to speculate on any other cryptocurrency. So um, we see that like the vast majority of network activity for any cryptocurrency, um, like Bitcoin is still the most used illicit, uh, for illicit purposes and most of it's speculative. <laughs> 
Monero is the same way, right? Where yeah. you still have some use that's illicit, but the majority of it's speculative. So it's good to expand the pool of users that are using it to not just be like this really small group. If you do make it widely implemented, it includes these other use cases that you don't typically have mm -hmm. for, uh, in, in privacy implementations. Well, at, at the end of the day, I think that also it restores of, because of what you just said, two of the um, uh, original uh, target ideas of cryptocurrencies. It's on the one hand, that you have you create an asset that is fungible <laughs> because it is in general uh, forgotten. The fact that at the end of the day, in bitcoins and uh, to some extent also Ethereum or the larger cryptocurrencies, uh, tokens are not necessarily fungible anymore. And uh, on the other hand, also the more egalitarian distribution of the uh, generation of new assets as well, because of the thing that you say related to mining. Mm -hmm. Great. Justin, I really appreciate your participation in the summer school. Thank you very much. I think that it gave us a completely different perspective on the how uh, basically you can also still defeat this uh, openness of the ledger while preserving it uh, publicly accessible and uh, this is something that i really like of your presentation as well so thank you very much i hope that we meet in person uh, at, at some point yeah thank you so much it was great talking to everybody it was great to hear you thank you very much have a nice uh, day there you have a full day ahead bye bye